Uh, hello everybody out there on YouTube and welcome again once again to Stephen Sturgill's Chess TV channel here on YouTube obviously. And once again, yes, we are looking at ideas in the Zamish uh, King's Indian for white. And uh, today we're going to look at something uh, a rather unique um, game or approach or line within the Zamish that ends up in a uh, classic sort of double rook end game with minor pieces still on. Uh, I think it's a bishop versus a bishop or a bishop versus a knight. We'll find out in a minute. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful example of converting a positional advantage uh, more than anything. And that's quite common in high grandmaster level uh, King's Indians. It's it can be tactical, but it can also be very um, a positional. And in fact, I want to show you a second line or actual variation within the same line that uh, shows Black giving a significantly better try, but it ends up uh, being um, a beautiful end game with uh, two knights versus two knights and. Uh, White has an incredible uh, pawn center, and well, we'll get there. Well, let's just see what what uh, ensues. It's it's rather beautiful. So, here we go. Off to the races. One d four. Knight f six, of course. C four, g six. Knight c three. Bishop g seven. E four. D six. F three. Black castle. Bishop e three. E5 here is an excellent try. Um, it's definitely nothing that hasn't been seen before for anybody that plays the the kid for black or that plays the any of the King's Indians for white. Uh, you're going to see E5 a lot of the time. Certainly not all the time, but it's a great idea. Here we're going to go ahead and push D5. You can open the center and play for a very, very sliver of an advantage that is very hard to convert. <clears throat> and in some cases, you may even gain a pawn, but lose just enough positional leverage to allow black to have fairly decent practical chances of drawing. So this, that's not a line I recommend. So anyways, having said that, moving on, d5, c6. And that's a little bit of an unusual try. It's a probably really good idea for black instead of playing the, the more traditional c5. Because you're really, really putting the question to white, what are you going to do about your d5 pawn? Well, we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to play queen d2, forming a battery, obviously, on that uh, diagonal, on the h6, c1 diagonal. c takes d5, c takes d5. Black pushes the a6 pawn, possibly preparing ideas of b5, etc., etc., or knight to... Uh, well, knight can't go c6 here, obviously, but perhaps uh, knight d7, knight knight b6, um, after getting the, the pawn out, perhaps. At any rate, uh, rook c1 is a great move in this position. Um, bishop d3 is very good. Bishop e2 is, is, is quite strong. But I, I really think here rook c1 is probably the most direct to solving most of White's practical problems on that side in terms of shoring up uh, the c3 knight and also allowing ideas of rook c2 or um, rook d1 forming a miniature battery on the uh, uh, half open file. Oh, well, I mean, obviously the d file is not open right now, but it could be at some point. At any rate, uh, Black played the intriguing knight h5 which is a little rare here for the fact that the other knight is nowhere to be seen on this side of the board, but okay, there's maybe some ideas in the position. And here, guys, I want to point out that <laughs> the move that I discovered and are played in the position was not recommended by Komodo. Um... This is obviously hyper aggressive, and, and it's an extra, incredibly committal move. So, 
g4 instantly kicking the knight comes to <clears throat> f4 <clears throat> knight g2 looking to trade off the knight and obviously if the knight trades here then black really achieved absolutely nothing so he plays the very high progressive h5 we're going to take that g crosses h5 queen comes down with check knight g3 Knight b8 comes to d7, looking to get into the mix and bring more pressure to the, uh, well, just to the general area, you know, of, of white's queen, bishop, knight, etc., and king. So, king d1, and I love this king march. The king is going to very quickly, if you can call it that, get to b1. Uh, so... And now we play, well, black plays, excuse me, first, bishop, well, actually, yeah, here's where I wanted to show the first version of the game. This is where the tree veer. so black here did not play the strongest move. He played a very decent move connecting the rooks. He played bishop d7. Not at all a terrible continuation, just not as forcing as the one that we'll later look at. But let's go ahead and look at this first um, rook comes to d1, queen goes back to e7, b4, uh, that's a obviously very committal move, kicking the knight, knight goes to a4, knight takes knight, bishop takes knight, knight f5, and, um, Here, uh, White had a variety of moves. He could have taken uh, G takes H, which is terrible beyond belief because then you have that and you can probably resign as Black. So Black is certainly not going to do that. Um, Queen F6. Was certainly possible here and if this then we have bishop takes f4 pawn takes and not the queen takes f4 but knight takes g7 and now rook c7 obviously getting to this very weak seventh rank king goes to h8 pawn takes g6 Pawn takes g6. Queen back to g2, looking to give check potentially on h3. Takes, take, and take. And more than anything here, guys, white has a very dynamic positional advantage over black. It's not that there's some magical tactic in this position. It's not that you know, white is up a piece. No, white's not up a piece. But what white has is, okay, white has space, an advanced center, a much more mobile and effective rook on g6. And the bishop on f1 actually is very, very influential in this position. Uh, just for starters, the bishop can play, if you play just a very simple move, the bishop obviously can come to b2, shoring up the f3 pawn. It can... Sh shoot out at some point and grab the a6 pawn or pressurize those diagonals uh certainly h3 is on the cards in this case obviously rook takes d6 is very direct Rook comes back to e6 stopping the bishop from taking e4 king up to b2 pawn b5 advance pushing the the uh d5 to d6 pawn, rook over, securing the h3 pawn on a protected square, king comes to c3 again getting active, check, and now that pawn on d6 is eternal, as some chess grandmasters like to say, that's obviously not eternal, but you get the idea, it's really become rock solid, okay, bishop to d5, Bishop d3 check. 
a3, king d4, okay, threatening the bishop, check, e6, take, take, check. I don't know if I'm going to call that a check or not, but some people do. Uh, okay, king is securing that base of pawns now, that advanced pawn. Okay, the rook's, rook's gone, black can resign. And from here, it's just gravy. It's just mop up, mop up on aisle nine. And, and you know, you get the idea. And da 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 da, checkmate. Okay, so. But. Let's see. That was not what was played uh, in, the, in the original continuation. Instead, um, okay, we, we looked at this rather tasty attempt by Black. So let's look at what was originally played. Pawn takes knight. And we push rook takes with protected check. And obviously, if, if the black queen exchanges here, quite honestly, black should just resign because it's going to be ridiculous trying to fight against a queen, two bishops, a rook, and a quite good pawn f structure and formation. If nothing else, white has uh, owns the center. Uh, the backwards pawn on d6 will absolutely get munched at some point. In fact, we can just pretend that that's the desperate move from a low-ranked player. And let's just take a look at what would ensue. Yeah, white's just crawling all up into black's business. And, uh, and in fact, I, I, I here I would have played... Just an immediate. Oh, excuse me. Not, not that. Excuse me. <laughs> not that. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like just. Um, I don't know. Pawn take. Uh, bishop. Excuse me. Bishop takes. Ah, it's locking up on me. Just a second. Bear with me. Memory RAM upgrade here for this system. It's a bit older. Okay, and it's going through its difficulty. Yeah, instead of that here, guys, I would have just taken the a6 pawn for starters. I think that's a more natural uh, look. And now, I, yeah, I preferred this e takes f, just stopping black from advancing. We're going to nibble on this on the queen side. And uh, let's see, I think I'll go here first. Push this guy. And I just don't think black has any counterplay here at, at all. I think it's just brutal. We've got the H pawn to play with. Check. Check. Skosh. Yeah, bishop's gone. <laughs> just here comes the D7 pawn. I'm going to go ahead and queen and take that guy. And I think just think that makes a lot more sense to play like this. And that's mate and 49. <laughs> All right, but let's get back to um, exactly what was played. And then I keep showing you guys a uh, little sub variation. So let's see, where was I? Let's see. Ah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so here. We saw um, bishop take knight, pawn take, 
and then queen comes to b2 offering an exchange and black goes ahead and concedes and now white has this beautiful pawn center uh, and it's just going to be unpleasant for black to even try to uh, munch on this e4 pawn with all of, of uh, all of this going on let's see just a second Yeah, and as I said, uh, it's just going to be difficult for black to, to really fight against the e4 pawn. But we'll see. So he does come to e8. Bishop goes to h3. Rook seeking a sack. Instead, of rook is going to munch on f7. Black rook comes to g6. And now the bishop, this is an intriguing move, guys, and... The idea of bishop e6 here is it has at least three functions that I can tell. One, the most obvious function is that it's protecting the rook, of obviously, on f7. It's protecting the pawn on d5. And in a way, even more importantly than that, it's, it's uh, stopping... Oops. It is stopping this rook not that not that okay this rook couldn't come here anyway because of the d5 pawn i get that but positionally you know it, even if something were to happen to these pawns it, it would still stop uh, or slow down ideas of the of the black rooks doubling so it's an intriguing little positional move strengthening white's uh, grip, if you will, on, on the black's king side, and black goes ahead and munches that pawn. And now pawn h3 again goes to a protected square of the light squared bishop. So that pawn is just immovable and untakeable and unassailable. King gets to a3. Now we're going to go ahead and munch on that f4 pawn with the rook. Black rook to d8. King b3. And the king's going to do a little shuffle dance. It's funny if I can rewind this. We can just see the king get here and then go through this little shuffle. Okay, and uh, after rook, let me back up a second. So, rook c3. And rook obviously does not want the white rook coming to g3. Go back to f6. And now there's ideas of checking on h6. Okay, black rook shores that up. And now we're going to threaten an immediate threat with bishop f5. Black rook goes back to d7, check on h6, check on, eight, on e6, and h4. e5, black takes, c7, and pretty much, guys, the house is on fire. There's several ways to finish black off here, but... I did think this was probably the most precise. King b2. I don't know. Just You can just play around with those little moves. It's not important. And then here, of course, you've got the immediate d6 check. And check. And the uh, bishop is obviously toast. These are just ridiculous spite checks, obviously. Black has nothing in the position. And he can take there. And now I just played the simple... In fact, that's a little slow. I think I probably <clears throat> should have played something like this instead. Now just come down, you know, something like this. And here comes the mate. And that's checkmate in 65. Okay, so that's that's what was basically first played in the game. And uh, hope you can appreciate how positional and also what a strong advanced um, pawn formation along with a very sort of unassailable structure 
that allowed uh, a couple of things. It allowed a continuous attack to develop, and it also allowed uh, a very strong, strongly defensible position that wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for Black to really do anything. You know, Black really had no good moves in, the, in those uh, in that position. So that was very fascinating to me. In a way, though, what's to come is even more fascinating, and we'll we'll get back to the um, starting <clears throat> position. Again, Rick C1 is very, very strong in these types of positions in general. And again, G4 guys, it's not in some respects the soundest move available it's extremely committal it's hyper aggressive if you like ultra attacking chess which i do i love it uh this is a phenomenal move but you really really have to know the lines or you're gonna it's gonna counter um uh, backfire and it'll be white uh probably getting mated in less than 40 moves uh at any rate, here, black plays moves that we already saw previously. And let's see, where was the shift? I'm trying to remember. Ah, yes. Now, this was a more aggressive try for black. So he shoots his bishop out, <coughs> excuse me, to h3. We're going to go ahead and trade bishops. And now we're going to play... Well, you could have played h6 here, frankly, which is a good move. Uh, but I felt that h6... Okay, positionally it's strong. But I felt that it also kind of kills the attack because after black moves the bishop back, the pawn sitting there in h6... While it's anchored and it's strong, it's it's sort of inhibiting white from developing uh, a continuous attack uh, through that avenue. And I just felt that at some point, black might get some kind of sliver of of quite strong practical counterplay. So I, I didn't. That's why I didn't like that move uh, here. So instead, you know, B4 is just right up in black's face you know what are you going to do do you want to lose a knight no i don't want to lose a black knight so knight goes back to d7 knight ce2 bishop f6 rook c7 now invade and you know anytime you can get a rook to the seventh rank s white uh it's a good thing <laughs> as long as it can't be taken immediately and uh rook 88 of course, if, if you're wondering why not rook c8, I, I hope you realize that would drop the knight instantly on d7. So that's that's why black did not play that. I've seen a lot of beginners uh, try to play like that, and then they freak out why they lose loose pieces. I'm like, no, you can't play that move. Rook hc1, doubling. Bishop g5. Rook b7 allows two... Uh, a couple it sets up rather a couple of things if black's not careful uh besides doubling on the seventh rank uh, assuming the black knight moves away then the uh b6 pawn is is uh going to be a delicious aperitif appetizer well in fact oh excuse me uh here that's a very good move. It's not what I played here in the position, but nothing wrong with that move at all. It's a very, very sound and quality continued uh, attack in the, position, in the position. But after knight f6, I really, really wanted to undermine the black king's, uh, I don't even want to say long-term safety, just sh short-term safety. So I went ahead and took uh, g6 off and after black takes that well thank you black now i have a delicious open seventh rank 
uh, which I think long term is much better than than uh, rook takes b6, which is good. And it's not at all a bad move, but it's not nearly as weakening to Black's king, obviously as as h takes uh, g6. So, and now we have our firm, fairly firm grip on the seventh rank by doubling uh, the rooks. Okay, and now Black can play <laughs> rook b8. We're going to give the king a check, king h8, rook a7, rook g8. And while rook g f7 is a good move, I felt that ultimately rook takes on g8 is a better move. So just remove the tension from the queen side. And now we have this delicious fork. Which is, okay, not a real fork, but we'll see the point in a second. The queen, by then coming to e3, has lots of crafty ideas of potentially getting to b6. Um, and obviously the queen is babysitting the knight on g5, so if, if there's any shenanigans there, then that, that knight will be toast. Um... potentially even weird ideas of knight f f5 uh which on the one hand is probably not sound but after after a pawn gets to f5 it could really really cramp up black style on the king side i wouldn't obviously that's probably a bad move and i wouldn't play it but uh you'd be surprised sometimes what you can get away with especially in rapid or blitz okay so um black knight pops to e8 uh, that is the f6 knight. And now f4. And obviously, well, if takes, that's not a strong move because we just have knight takes and we don't even need to take back with the queen. h3, trades, and you know, white has a very, very strong initiative in this position. I mean, that's just crystal clear. Now, we, yeah, we take the knight back with check, etc., etc. Okay, that's not how it was played, so I don't want to go down that avenue uh, too, too far. So that's why, uh, after this move, instead of taking with the e-pawn, and black played the knight back to h7. And here, um, rook takes a6 was very strong, but I felt that uh, f takes e5 was more undermining, ultimately, to white's, to, excuse me, to black's counter center. Uh, not, not to mention it absolutely opens the f-file uh, for once and for all. Now, now Rick gobbles on a6. Queen c3, hitting the weakness on e5. Uh, also, obviously, can come to uh, c7. Go ahead and take that pawn off in the center with check. Rook takes, also protecting the b4 pawn from the black queen. Black queen comes to g4. We push the d pawn. Rook a8. Queen d4, offering an exchange. And we'll go ahead and force that exchange now. And this, guys, is where it gets rather beautiful for me. Um, let's see what happens. So we have um, two knights versus two knights, a rook versus two rooks. But there's there are a couple of key differences, aren't there? Um... White's pawn on d6 is deep into enemy territory, and even the pawn on b4 uh, is about to cross into enemy territory. And conversely, black will waste at least three temp tempi uh, getting a black pawn into white's camp. 
and it'll be a meaningless push at any rate. So all of the attacking chances are in white's favor. So let's see what happens. Knight comes to e4. Black pushes g5. White rook comes to b7. Instead of giving up the exchange, or trading rather, we go ahead and play knight g5. Black knight takes h2. e2 knight comes to g3. Black knight goes back to g4. White knight goes to f5. Black king goes to h8. Rook e7. Rook f8. a3. Knight e5. Rook exchanges on e5. Black's down a piece. I should resign, but computers don't resign. So, well, unless maybe they, maybe they do a few programs. Through, I don't know. Uh, knight d7. Rook b5. Rook f6. a4. Rook g6. Knight e7. Rook f6. a5. Rook f1 check. King b2, rook f2 check, king b3, king g7, a6, king h6, a7, rook f8, rook b8, rook exchanges on b8, under promote to a knight, it, it takes, knight comes to e6, knight d7, <laughs> Looking to force the knights off, it goes back, and we have the b5 push. b6 takes b7, new queen, here comes the knight, and here comes checkmate. Guys, that's checkmate in 69, but it, it doesn't really matter. Black would have resigned, obviously, in real life in an over-the-board game. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Probably... Probably here. I think uh, any Grandmaster would have said, mm, Nope, I'm not going to be able to compete with a pawn on b4 and a pawn on d6. And a pawn on h2, and a pawn on h, uh, a2. And if they had any doubts, well. After that move, they can, I promise you, 9 out of 10 uh, Fide Masters would resign after this. Because you're just a piece down. White's pawn militia is unstoppable. So th this is a, a very, very high level, very complex, very nuanced, extremely positional uh, version of the Zamish attack. So we didn't see lots of fireworks. This wasn't a checkmate in, in 26 or 32 or 40. It was a rather um, longish or typically long game in the King's Indian Zamish. Uh, but it shows the richness not only of the Zamish, but of the King's Indian in general. And I, I thought this was just a beautifully well-played positional masterpiece. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it gives you some food for thought in your continued journey in chess. And I hope you play the Zamish, study it, study all the King's Indians. They're all phenomenal variations. And best of luck to you and your chess. Until next time.